All right, welcome back to ABA exam review in our BCBA exam practice question series. We're going through the next set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for our practice exam study guides and access to our question bank on our new app. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in our Sunday shout out. As always, work hard, study hard. Let's get going. Question one, a woman asks her friend for advice on handling her son's behavior. Her son has started to color on all of the walls. The woman's friend tells her to use negative reinforcement whenever she sees the sun drawing on the walls. What is wrong with this statement? This is a parent training-esque question because you need to think about these things when talking with parents about commonly misused terms. And negative reinforcement could be the most misunderstood and misused term in our entire field because negative reinforcement increases behavior. Many people use negative reinforcement to mean we're going to decrease something. But we know what? Well, we know negative simply means to take away. Reinforcement means to increase. So if this woman wants help handling her son's behavior of coloring on the walls, if she uses negative reinforcement, what's going to happen? She's going to increase coloring on walls. So what is wrong with this statement? A, the woman would be using positive reinforcement, not negative reinforcement. We don't know her intervention, so we can't say for sure what she's using, so A is out. B, negative reinforcement does not decrease behavior. That is absolutely true. Negative reinforcement increases behavior. That's the issue here. C, only punishment can be used to decrease behavior. Well, that's just not true, right? What else can be used? Extinction. So don't rush through it, right? You have to think about these things. Punishment decreases, so does extinction. And then D, nothing is wrong with this statement. Well, there is, right? If she's going to try to handle this behavior, right, and decrease the coloring on the walls, negative reinforcement is, is going to increase, right? So the problem is negative reinforcement doesn't decrease behavior. So what is wrong? B. Greg just got out of a three-hour meeting and is starving. He starts searching through the refrigerator in his backpack, but cannot find any food to eat. What is missing that is preventing Greg from eating? So what are we missing here that is preventing Greg from eating? So just think about this, right? Greg got out of a three-hour meeting and is starving. What's taking place? Deprivation. He's being deprived. And deprivation is related to well, motivating operations because through deprivation, what happens? The value of certain consequences increase. Eating has increased dramatically. The MO is present. There is motivation to eat because he is starving. The problem is what? He can't find any food to eat. So the thing that is missing is B, the SD, the discriminative stimuli. Remember, the SD simply signals a consequence is available. And he can have all the motivation in the world. He can be as hungry as he wants, but until there's an SD for food, he can't eat. See a prompt? Well, without an SD, you can't have a prompt, and there's no prompt presently available, but there's no SD, and the prompt isn't preventing Greg from eating. The lack of a signal that food is available is preventing Greg from eating. And then D, a consequence. Well, the consequence is going to happen after Greg finds food or after Greg eats. Before that happens, something has to tell Greg, all right, do this and you can eat. The motivation is there. The MO is there. Greg is missing an SD, which is preventing him from eating. Ashley just started a new job as a behavior analyst at an ABA clinic that serves children from low-income backgrounds. Ashley has three cases transferred to her. She is told, based on prior data and treatment, that two of the children's behaviors are attention-based and one is sensory-based. Ashley decides she's going to conduct her own FBA and then determine the function. What describes Ashley's behavior in terms of accepting the functions of the behavior? Long question. When you get a long question, you need to be sure you analyze the question first before going to the answer choices. There's too much information here. First things first, what is the question asking? It's asking about Ashley's behavior in terms of accepting the functions of the behavior. So we know she gets three cases, and she's told that, well, if two are attention-based, and one is sensory-based. Well, Ashley says, I'm going to do my own FBA, and then I'll figure it out. So did she accept the functions? No. She said she's going to determine on her own, through her own analysis, or the, I should say her own assessment, what the functions are. So what describes her behavior in terms of accepting the functions? A, parsimony. Well, the simplest explanation or the simplest answer would be to just accept the functions at face value, right? That's the simplest explanation. 
Ashley's not going that route. She's not necessarily being parsimonious, which is a good thing, right? Because she's going to go all the way to her assessment and redo this assessment and go through the entire process. B, experimentation. Well, we're not talking about her assessment. We're talking about her behavior as far as accepting the functions went. And she didn't accept the functions. She executed or implemented or utilized C, philosophical doubt. Philosophical doubt lets us doubt prior outcomes, prior results, and that's what she's doing. Someone told her, well, based on our data and treatment, everything is attention and sensory based. And she says, I'm going to you I'm going to exercise philosophical doubt and not just believe that until I see it for myself. So the actual FBA, right, if she's doing a functional analysis, then we're talking experimentation. If she's representing uh, functional control, then we're talking analysis. All she's done, though, is said, I don't rely on your data and treatment, and I'm going to exercise doubt that these are attention and sensory based. Until I do my own assessment, I'm not going to accept that as a fact. So what describes Ashley's behavior in terms of accepting the functions of the behavior? C, philosophical doubt. You have to answer what the question is asking you. Richard is tired of his wife forgetting to do things like close the garage door or run the dishwasher. Richard decides to start leaving post-it notes around the house with little reminders. A few weeks later, Richard notices that his wife is now closing the garage door and running the dishwasher more often. What can Richard determine with some certainty? If you ever get questions that are asking you, what can you be sure of? Or what can you determine? You got to be very careful, okay? Because remember, until we start to see really some experimental control, there's not a whole lot we can truly determine, okay? However, what do we know about Richard and his situation? Well, he knows his wife used to not close the garage door on the dishwasher. Once he started leaving post-it notes around the house, all of a sudden his wife is closing the garage door and running the dishwasher. Is there experimental control? Well, we're not sure. He hasn't done an experiment. He just added a variable. He added post-it notes. So what can we say about this for sure? A, there is no correlation between his notes and his wife's behavior. Well, we certainly cannot say that for sure because ever since he's left post-it notes, her behavior's changed. It seems to be correlated. So B, there is correlation between his notes and his wife's behavior. Absolutely. Do we know if it's causing it? No, but it's certainly correlated. As we leave more post-it notes, her behavior changes and changes. C, there is no causation between his notes and his wife's behavior. Well, we can't say that for certain either because we haven't run any experiments. We haven't changed anything. We don't know for sure if there's cause or not. So D, there is causation between his notes and his wife's behavior. Same thing, right? We can't be for certain whether or not there's causation between his notes and his wife's behavior. All we know at this time is there is some correlation because as he as he leaves post-it notes, her behavior continues to change. Until he runs experiments, he can't say for sure for certain there's any functional control at all. So what can Richard determine with some certainty? B, there is correlation between his notes and his wife's behavior. Each time Lisa enters the room, she knocks four times on the wall and three times on the door. Her sister wants to reduce this behavior, so whenever she sees Lisa enter the room, she runs up and hugs Lisa tightly to the point where Lisa can't move her arms. This would be considered what? All right, again, let's be careful here. We know Lisa enters the room. She knocks four times on the wall and three times on the door. Her sister wants to reduce the behavior, so when Lisa enters the room, she runs up and hugs Lisa tightly. Lisa can't move her arms. If Lisa can't move her arms, can she engage in the behavior of knocking? She cannot. So what are we considering this? A, physical prompting. Is she prompting her to do anything? No, she's preventing her from doing something. B, movement prompting. Is she prompting her to do anything? No, she's preventing her from doing something. C, extinction. Now, extinction versus response blocking. Are they the same? They are not. Response blocking is not extinction. And we're going to say that over and over and over again. In order to engage in extinction or in order to implement extinction, you have to withhold reinforcement for a response. In order to withhold reinforcement for a response, that response must occur. If you're blocking that response from occurring, you can't be putting it on extinction. That's the issue here. Lisa is not even letting her engage in the response, so she's blocking the response. Now, maybe this works to reduce it. Maybe it acts as a punisher. Who knows? but it doesn't act as extinction. 
not until Lisa can actually do not until she can knock, right? That can her sister implement extinction. So again, response blocking is not extinction. They have to be able to engage in the response. So if Lisa is hugging her tightly to the point, or sister is hugging Lisa tightly to the point where she can't move her arms, this would be considered D, response blocking. A functional analysis determines that the behavior is occurring automatically. What would be the simplest way to think about extinction of this behavior? All right, think about this for just a second. Where do we start with extinction? You know, why, why do we even determine the function? Why does it matter for extinction? Well, the function is going to tell us what's, what type of reinforcer is likely to maintain the behavior, right? If the behavior is attention, reinforcement, uh, attention as reinforcement will likely maintain that behavior. So if our behavior is automatic, how are we going to think about extinction or that behavior? A, when a demand is given, from now on, don't remove the demand. Well, A sounds more like what? Sounds like more like escape or avoidance, right? And we're not talking about that. We're talking about automatic. B, do not give any items in the presence of maladaptive behavior. That sounds like a tangible function. C, prevent sensory stimulation when the behavior occurs. There we go. The way we put automatic behavior on extinction, we've got to somehow block that stimulation, that reinforcing stimulation from automatic behavior, which makes this a very difficult thing to treat. And then D, avoid direct eye contact when the behavior is observed. Again, that sounds just like attention. The behavior is occurring automatically. What would be the simplest way to think about extinction for this behavior? Well, C, prevent sensory stimulation when the behavior occurs, because that's most likely what's going to reinforce and maintain that current automatic behavior. If you were conducting a free operant preference assessment in the client's bedroom, how would you measure preference? So what type of assessment are we talking about? Well, we're talking about a free operant preference assessment. What does it mean for free operant? Because we can do a naturalistic, right? We can do a free operant. Or naturalistic and free operant, the same? Yeah, pretty much, okay? Because we're not really controlling or driving anything, okay? So what are we going to do with a free operant preference assessment? How are we going to measure preference? A, you would give the client one item at a time and describe their interaction. Well, that's not very free, okay? It's very contrived. That's a single stimulus preference assessment, right? One of the most contrived there is. B, you would interview the parent, make a list of preferred items. Well, that's not a free operant preference assessment. That's an indirect preference assessment. C, you would put all the client's items on the ground and have them select their favorite item. Well, not quite, okay, because they're not doing a multiple stimulus operant or preference assessment. What you're going to do with a free operant is you're going to observe the client in their bedroom or wherever, their environment, and record how long they engage with an item. So you're just sitting in a corner basically watching and learning from what they engage in. So if you're going to conduct a free operant preference assessment in the client's bedroom, how would you measure preference? D, you would observe the client in their bedroom and record how long they engage with an item. Excellent. Check out BCBA exam or uh, behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our practice exams. Uh, be back every Friday and Saturday with more videos. We're going to finish up our fourth practice exam next week. Um, work hard. Study hard when you pass. Let us know. As always, see you soon.